Again, this is Open Line with today's host, Father Brian Malady. In North America, call toll free 1 833 288 EWTN. That's 1 833 288 3986. Outside North America, call 1 205 271 2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. And we welcome you again to Open Line here on EWTN, the Global Catholic Radio Network. And uh, Jack Williams is away today. I'm Tom Price. Glad to be joined on our Thursday edition of the program with America's favorite Dominican, and that would be Father Brian Milady. How are you, Padre? Just fine, Tom. Coming to you today from St. Gregory's Church in Plantation, Florida. Beautiful. You're uh, yes. leading a retreat there. What's well, what's happening? Yes, I'm leading a retreat. Fantastic. Well, very good. Hope that that goes well for you and for uh, everyone who will be attending with you. Let me give you those phone numbers, 833-288-EWTN. If you have a uh, question for Father Brian today, 833-288-3986. Now, if you're listening to us outside of North America, and we do have listeners all over the world, you'll want to call the uh, U.S. country code. Most cases, that's going to be the number one. And then 205 271 Two nine eight five. You can also text the letters EWTN to five five zero zero zero. Wait for our response, and then text us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. And of course, you can always shoot us an email. The address there is openline at ewtn.com. Openline at ewtn.com. Be sure you put Thursday in the subject line or Father Brian in the subject line. We'll make sure that we uh, put the right email with the right host. So today, Father Brian, you're going to talk a little about the Transfiguration and Lent, right? Yes, because that was last Sunday's gospel, Mm -hmm. and I really didn't get a chance to talk about it. And I think it's a very important uh, gospel for Lent. You may wonder why we read that gospel during Lent when we celebrate a feast of the Transfiguration on August 6th. But the reason is, first of all, because this is an extremely important episode in Christ's life. The evangelists almost all mention it and discuss it. You will notice that it has to do with witnessing to who Jesus is, and witnesses are very important in the Old Testament. So first, the situation, the physical location witnesses, because it's on a mountain, and human beings met God on a mountain. We see this at Mount Sinai. We can see this even in the temples that the Aztecs and the Mayans built were artificial mountains, and Jerusalem itself was on a mountain. And one of the reasons we raise the altar above the sanctuary through steps in our churches is because of the mountain. When he brings Peter, James, and John up this mountain, he has a revelation where he lets the glory of his divine personhood shine through his physical body. And then he has a conversation as he appears, talking to the two great cultic mediators of the Old Testament, Moses, who represents the law, and Elijah, who represents the prophets. So the Old Testament witnesses to Christ as being God. Peter, James, and John are the three great authorities in the New Testament. They represent them, because one is the first pope, one is the first great contemplative, John the Divine, And then, of course, we have James, the first bishop of Jerusalem. So the New Testament witnesses to this. Also, remember that God, the Trinity, witnesses to this. So the Father's voice speaks. That's the Father and the Word. And from the bright shining cloud, which is the holy Shekinah, that covered the mountain when the law was given and the sacrifices were performed, and also represents, when Christ, God says, my beloved son, represents the Holy Spirit. And what are Moses and Elias speaking about with Jesus that all of these things witness to? Well, they're speaking about his passion. So the Old Testament testifies in the necessity of the cross in the Christian religion. 
Sometimes today in the Christian religion today, we have an easygoing American Christianity that one Protestant divine, H. Uh, uh, Reimer Niebuhr, described as a God without wrath, brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. Well, the testimony of Moses and Elias speaking to Christ is completely against this way of looking at things. And Lent, of course, is when we experience some sort of sufferings, some sort of discipline, and we give up things, but not just because we think those things are bad. We don't think they're bad at all. We do them because we want to prepare ourselves through our participation in the cross uh. to experience Easter. And so in Lent, we're given this experience of Jesus as a divine person. Now, he doesn't have a risen body here. It's that his body shows forth his divinity. Mm. But it's to give us hope in the midst of our Lenten practices. Okay, you're having trouble, you know, with your promises you made to give up things for Lent. Yeah. Have hope. Have hope. This yes. is what the end and final purpose is. It's about something good. It's about human integrity. It's about giving yourself completely to the Lord and loving God for a right intention. That's why, if you recall, when they come down the mountain, Jesus tells them, don't tell anyone about this vision mm -hmm. until the passion has been experienced. But it's to give people strength in the midst of their own passion to realize that Christ is the second person in the Trinity and no amount of evil. And we need to have this lesson today. Who knows, we might be in a nuclear war soon. No mm -hmm. amount of evil can overcome the hope we have in our Lord and in the next life. So that's why Peter, who's almost in an ecstasy or a trance or, uh, you know, a, a mystical experience, uh -huh says, and, and, and we should say this too, as we during Lent experience this gospel and this mystery, Lord, it's good that we are here. Yes, indeed. Wow. Thank you so much for unpacking that for us. It is Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Mullady here on EWTN. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Looks like uh, two calls have already come in. We've uh, got a couple of open lines right now, so if you call in right now, uh, we can probably get you on today's show. Here's a question from Kevin. What is the meaning, Father, of Matthew 5, verses 17 through 19, about abolishing the law and the prophets? Oh, remember Christ says, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. Mm -hmm. He didn't come to do away with the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments themselves, and many of the practices that were recommended to live them properly in Deuteronomy. And you can think about things like uh, the law of first fruits, where even though we affirm the right to private property, uh -huh. according to the law of first fruits, you're allowed to take the first harvest. But whatever you leave on the trees or falls to the ground or the second harvest, you have to leave for the poor and the widows and the orphans. Mm that those things are still in force. But what Christ does, you'll notice, is he jumps to the interior motivation behind them. So that's why, for example, when it comes to adultery, he says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, uh, he, doesn't, he refuses to reduce adultery to a legal definition of having sex to someone whom you're not married or someone who's not your wife. He says, anyone who looks at another with lust, notice it's the heart he's criticizing here, the lustful heart, mm -hmm. which is betrayed by the lustful look, has already committed adultery. And it's interesting that um, uh, the great, great example, of course, in the Old Testament of the lustful look is when David sees Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. Remember from the... Uh, rooftop, which yes. he was bathing. Yes. He gives up all these wonderful gifts God has given him. And he's so far gone in seeking to have lust and cover up his lust that he even murders, murders her husband uh, to keep his sin secret, murders her husband who wasn't even Jewish. He's a Hittite, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but he obeys the Jewish law. He has no interest in listening to any of those things while he's in his lust and blinded by it. And all the same is true of all the commandments. In the New Testament, and especially in Lent, we're asked to examine our heart with regard to this. And uh, as you know, in Lent talks about not having hardness of heart. Uh -huh. A hard heart is a heart that looks upon another as someone whom you can use and dominate for the sake of your own ego. Mm. All right. Thank you so much for that, and uh, appreciate all of your emails. In a moment, we're going to get to the phones and talk with Dan in St. Louis, also Mary in North Carolina. A couple of lines open for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Open line Thursday with Father Brian Milady on EWTN. The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. This is Father Joseph Mary. This week on The Catholic Sphere, I'm examining the lives of two teenage men recently beatified, both of whom had a great love for the Eucharist, plus how college students are following in their footsteps today. The Catholic Sphere, Sunday afternoon, 2.30 Eastern on EWTN Radio. We live in a world of extreme polarization, often consumed by anger and anxiety, a climate that is dividing our country and our world, a division so wide there is even confusion within our church. And today most secular news sources only serve to deepen this divide. But at Catholic News Agency, our mission is to be a witness to the truth of our Catholic faith, providing trustworthy, relevant, and timely news affecting the global church, as well as in-depth coverage of the Pope, the Vatican, the church in the U.S., and the ongoing battle for the culture of life. Every day, CNA's reporters and editors maintain a continuous, faithful watch on the people and the events that impact lives and the souls of Catholics, delivering more news from a Catholic perspective than anyone else. Catholic News Agency, a service of EWTN News. Trusted, timely, Catholic. Engage at catholicnewsagency.com. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. Glad you're with us for Open Line uh, Thursday with Father Brian Milady here on EWTN Radio. Our phone number again, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you would like, you can text the letters EWTN to 55000. Just wait for our, uh, our real quick robo message out there to you. And then when you get that, reply to it and uh, just give us your first name and your brief question. And of course, as we like to say, message and data rates may apply. All right, if you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. Here is Dan in St. Louis listening on YouTube. Hey, Dan, what's on your yeah. mind today? Hey, everyone. I had a question about um, just, just obviously when he was suffering the scourging and then on the crucifixion, um, he seemed to be wounded in pain, uh, bleeding, and just all the typical signs you would expect from someone embodying a complete human nature. But then when he's fasting for 40 days and goes without food, it seems like that seems to be incompatible with the human nature that would have starved in that time frame. Um, so I was just trying to understand better the, the Catholic understanding on the compatibility of him going without food for 40 days and just his other earthly life, which seems to have all the typical limitations of, of human life. Okay. Okay. Well, I would say that uh, the fasting for 40 days is uh, the same as the other two. I mean, it was very, it's very clear in the scriptures. He was very hungry. And though you cannot live without water, you can live without food or a very small amount of it for quite some time. Uh, there are people who go on hunger strikes, for example, to yeah, do that. Yeah. And so he's very, very hungry. But the meaning of the temptation episode is that Satan 
represents to him that he could resolve this horrible feeling he has of hunger merely by doing kind of a, kind of a magical, spectacular um, <laughs> feat, mm. uh, a miracle. But it's not God's will that he do that miracle. Christ does everything according to the will of his father, and it's not his father's will. So he tries this tactic of using this extreme hunger he's experiencing uh, in order to tempt him to be uh, uh, get, do things outside the will of God, not to trust in God, which is, of course, what Adam basically mm -hmm, did. Mm -hmm. And Christ survives the temptation. And it's interesting there. I always find that episode interesting because Christ could have performed an exorcism, but he didn't. Remember, there were many places in Scripture where he exorcised the devil. Mm -hmm. But here he meets the devil who can also who can quote scripture, which is interesting, the, with merely quotations of scripture too. In other words, he shows him the, the goodness of a human will uh, in union with God is sufficient to overcome his temptation. And he does that as an example to us. Christ can't be internally tempted. He doesn't have concupiscence. Mm -hmm. But he does this as an example to us that we will be very tempted in trying to live the Christian life. And as long as we rely on him, not on ourselves, then we need not fear Satan's temptation. Okay. Dan, is that helpful for you? Yeah, absolutely perfect. Uh, yeah, and I just Googled longest hunger strikes, and they do exceed 40 days. That makes a lot of sense. All right, yeah, thank you. Appreciate your call. That opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Want to remind you that uh, we broadcast the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass from Our Lady of the Angels Chapel live every morning at 8 a.m. Eastern here on EWTN Radio right after the Sunrise Morning Show. And to be sure that you don't miss out, we can send you a link to your email inbox each and every day. Just visit EWTN.com and click on subscribe. Back to the phones now. Here is Mary in North Carolina listening on the EWTN app. Hey there, Mary. What's on your mind today? Thank you. I wanted clarification in two areas. Uh, the first one is in the Apostles' Creed, when it says that Jesus descended into hell, my understanding was that that meant he went to some place where he got the faithful from the Old Testament and took them to heaven. Uh, so my question, is that true, or did they go to purgatory because they needed to have some further atonement? And then secondly, when we die... Uh, my understanding is if we die in the state of grace, we go to heaven. If we need, uh, again, to have some atonement, uh, we go to purgatory. But what about the people that um, God knows are going to be damned? Do they have to wait for the final judgment, or do they go to hell? So I would just like to understand this. I'm afraid it's going to come up in an RCIA class, and I want to be clear on it. Okay. All right, well, it's a complicated question you asked me with her radio program. However, first of all, let's talk the second question first. The teaching of the Catholic Church, which was defined by a council in the Middle Ages, is that there are two judgments of every person. The first one occurs at death. And at death, we're judged personally. And we either become worthy of heaven or of hell. The people that are judged worthy of hell go to hell. The people who are judged worthy of heaven could go directly to heaven. Uh, they're in the state of grace, but even the people who go to purgatory remember die in the state of grace. So their eventual destination is heaven also, though they may have to suffer a passive purgation for the temporal punishment, not the eternal punishment, the temporal punishment of what remains to be atoned for not with respect to God, but with respect to ourselves and others for whatever sins they may have committed on earth. In addition to this, there's the second judgment, the final judgment, the last judgment, when Christ himself will pronounce judgment on every soul publicly in the front of the assembled creation so that the saints... And, of course, purgatory will end then at the end of time. So the saints and whoever is judge worthy of heaven 
will be known to the whole assembled creation, even if they've been great sinners and converted, their conversion will add to their renown as glorifying God. The people judge worthy of hell have their wickedness, even secret wickedness. Remember, nothing is spoken that will not be not made known, even in darkness and secret. It will be made known to the whole assembled creation, and that will add to the wicked suffering, not the hell suffering of hell. They already experienced that, but the fact that everyone knows it now, what they did. Mm -hmm. Regarding the uh, first question, Yes, Jesus descended into what was called the limbo of the just. Now, that could have included people who needed to go to purgatory, but died in the state of grace. If so, when Jesus rose from the dead, they would do their purgation, passive purgation, and then the uh, people who didn't need that would go directly to heaven. And the uh, people who uh, go to hell are left there. We had the example of that today. In uh, the parable of Dives and Lazarus that was in the mass readings today, the rich man and the poor man, mm -hmm. remember the rich man dies and goes to hell. Mm -hmm. And this is before Christ uh, dies and rises from the dead. And he sees an infinite chasm between, he sees his, the poor man with bosom of Abraham, which means basically the limbo of the just. Mm -hmm. And he cries out, have Lazarus come and touch me by tongue because I'm suffering terribly in these flames. And Abraham says, sorry, there's an infinite gap between you and us that cannot be bridged. And that's before Christ dies on the cross and yeah. Christ is dead. Yeah. So the, an the basic answer is there are two judgments, one of the individual and then one where the individual's goodness or wickedness is made known to the whole assembled creation, pronounced by Christ. The uh, just see him in his humanity and his divinity, the damned see him only in his humanity. And that's expressed in Matthew 25. Okay. And Mary, thank you so much uh, for your call. It is Open Line, yes. open line Thursday with Father Brian Milady here on EWTN. If you call right now, we can probably get you on today's show, 833 833- 288-EWTN is that number, 833-288-3986. Uh, speaking of heaven and hell, Jerry sent us an email. He says, I get it. I get that we live this life and then choose either heaven or hell, but why do we have to go through this life at all to make that choice? <laughs> well, first of all, every day you're choosing, you're choosing between heaven or hell. Yeah, yeah. There was some crazy theory that some theologians, really important theologians made, especially German theologians, uh, in the 70s and 80s that maintained that the only choice you really ever made in your life was the one at death. Well, this is silly. Yeah. And one of them actually said it because you don't have a body anymore, which is even stupider in my opinion. But uh, every day you live, you become worthy of heaven or hell. And uh, it's based on the choices that you make every day. This life is a pilgrimage, and your pilgrimage is on the way to heaven or to hell. Mm. If we were angels now, the angels' pilgrimage ends with their first choice, where they choose either self or God. If they choose self, they go to hell. If they choose God, they go to heaven. But angels are that way because they have this purified and perfect intellect. And they have no body. So their choice is so strong and so deep that it's one is only needed and it's irrevocable because we have bodies. We live in this pilgrim state and we need to look on every day as an occasion for us to grow in the virtues and to leave vices. And this, of course, forms us when we die to either see God or not. Now, it's true. Some people do con con convert at the last moment of their lives. But most of us, our conversion is an ongoing thing. And it's because we, you know, God created the world that we would be good and reflect him. And that's throughout our pilgrimage from the time we're children until the time we die for most of us. So we need to just make every day 
Remember what we say during uh, Lent? This is the acceptable time. This is the day of salvation. Mm, yes. Today, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. So every day we have to look on this as um, a preparation for eternity. All right. Jerry, thank you so much for your email. If you would like to send us an email for a future show, here's the address. Openline at EWTN.com. Openline at EWTN.com. Be sure you put Thursday in the subject line or Father Brian in the subject line so that we can make sure to uh, match them up with uh, the right person. In a moment, we're going to get back to the phones here, and we have a line available for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Open line Thursday with Father Brian Mullady. As a Catholic talk show host and speaker and author, I'm often asked, how should we pray? How do we pray? Really? It's up to you, and that's between you and the Lord. We have wonderful, wonderful formalized prayers in the Catholic faith, such as a rosary, the Lord's Prayer, novenas. But you can also just open up your heart and say, Lord, help, SOS. It's as simple as that. How you pray is really up to you. Ask the Lord how you should pray, and he'll answer you. And now, the EWTN Family Prayer with Father Joseph. Family, a prayer that we pray together is a powerful prayer. So please pray together with me, our EWTN Family Prayer. Today we pray for young people. Heavenly Father, we worship you, our Creator. You have brought each one of us into existence because of your loving generosity. Protect young people from the many snares of temptation that surround them. Shield them from drugs, fornication, self-indulgence, and sin. Lead them in the path of life and of true love. Surround them with angels to guard, defend, and guide them. Let none of them be lost but grant that they may fulfill your plans and find lasting happiness. Amen. This is Jack Williams. If you missed any part of today's show, catch the Encore tonight at 10 Eastern and check out the podcast anytime at EWTNradio.net and click podcast. Is the Bible the sole rule of faith? Are we saved by faith alone? Hear the answers on Call to Communion tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern. Now back to Open Line with Father Brian Mullady. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Still time to get your call in to Father Brian Mullady at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. All right, let's go right now to Tony in Connecticut, listening on the EWTN app. Hey, Tony, what's on your mind today, sir? Hey, how are you? Um, I had a question for Father, uh, and it's basically um, Judges 17. Uh, And it was, uh, it says, uh, and his mother said, uh, blessed be my son, the Lord. Uh, And it had to do with with her molting, Silver and making an idol uh, to to worship uh, uh, to dedicate to her son to the Lord or something like that. And uh, I'm a devout Catholic, and, and uh, I just want to. When I read that, uh, it was a little uh, uh, sort of confusing to me because it almost felt as if the Lord was allowing this idol to be made for her son uh, in his a graven, a graven image. Um, and I just want to know a little bit more understanding of our Father's take on, on, on what that meant. Okay. Well, I didn't understand the question totally. Did you understand him? I think he wants a little better of a handle on this whole graven images business and when we're, when we're talking about uh, statues and, and things of that sort. Well, you know, not all, all uh, <laughs> representations are forbidden, even in the Old Testament. Uh, you may recall that um, God himself commanded that the angels be put over the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. Remember, they had two cherubim over the Ark of the Covenant. Yes. 
And he also commanded that the serpent be made, the seraph serpent, and put on the staff when they were experiencing illness so that all who looked at it might be healed. The prohibition against images basically has to do with worshiping the material which the images are about. Mm. And this came up in a very, very long and bloody controversy in the history of the church that was reflected in the Protestant Reformation later called the iconoclasm uh, clastic in, uh, controversy in which some emperor in Byzantium decided that the reason they were losing the war before the Muslims was because they had icons of Mary and Joseph and the saints and all that. And as you know, in Islam, images are totally forbidden. Yeah. They use writing instead. So uh, he forbade images. Well, the Christian community was so tied to images. And the reason is because Christ became man. Uh, Cardinal Ratzinger and others have long reflections on this, but it's the fact that we have an incarnational religion that allows us to make representations, but we don't worship the image. I don't worship the plaster the statue's made of, for heaven's sakes. Right, right, right. And so the uh, classic answer to this, and you can find it in the catechism, is that we don't venerate the image itself. We venerate the person whom the image represents. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, in normally, it's, there was a long discussion about whether you could make an image of God or not. Well, of course they do, but everybody knows it's not God. Yeah. It's, it's just something to remind us and call modern devotion. Why on earth do we need any of these things? Because we have bodies and senses. Sure. We're not angels. Yeah. And so we have rituals and we have images and things like that. So if that's what you're asking. It's true there's a prohibition against worshiping idols, but not every image is an idol. Some images are just what they are. In other words, they're like the picture of my mother uh -huh. at home. Yeah. I remember we had a priest who was trying to convert or maybe even discuss our religion with a Baptist seminarian from Berkeley. And he said, oh, you, you worship Mary because you have statues of her. So he said when he came to visit our house, so he went up, father went up to visit him. And in his dorm room, he had a picture of Elvis. <laughs> and so he said, oh, you worship Elvis <laughs> because you have a picture of him in your yeah, room. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's a, it's beautiful. It's beauty in our faith. Of course, of course. Now, I'm certainly no expert, father, but it occurs to me that the key word here is graven. Is that, is, well, what does graven mean? Yeah. As far as I understand, it just means made by human hands. Uh, but maybe I'm mistaken about that. I uh, never looked up the word. I real. actually looked it up. I, I looked it up a couple of weeks ago. And, and, and oh, I, good. What did it say? Well, as I recall, it was it was closer to the idea of for idolatry, for uh, for worship of that image rather than okay. rather than, as, as you're saying, a holy reminder of, you know, Jesus or Mary right. or the saints. Uh, and there you go. So, Tony, thank you so much for your call. Here's a question from Karen. I heard someone say that since we are in God's image, then God is also in our image. Is that right? No. <laughs> okay. God is the primary analogous for everything. He's the model. We're merely the copy, if you want to put it that way. And the fact that we're in God's image, first of all, means that we have intelligence and we have a will. But God is an infinite intelligence and an infinite will, and they're one in him. Mm -hmm. So we're in his image, but he's not in ours. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for that. It's Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Milady. Still time for you to jump in on the phones at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 833- 288-3986. Michael is watching us on YouTube right now. Michael J., who says, this is a silly question, I know, but I've always wondered, how did the apostles know that the two persons in the transfiguration were Elijah and Moses? How did they know? I would assume it was because of the way they were dressed. You know, the prophets were dressed in a very specific way. Uh -huh. And, of course, part of the revelation would be part of the revelation. Sure. They were Elijah and Moses. And of course, also what they were talking about, each one would do it from his own perspective. Uh -huh. So Moses uh -huh. would do it from the law 
and the sacrifices, and Elijah would do it from the conversion of heart, because the prophets emphasize that greatly. All right, very good. Michael J., thank you for your question. That was not a silly question at all. Here's, no. one, here's one from May, who's watching us on YouTube this afternoon. Since I have never gotten married or have any children, but I have taken care of my mother and father, what does God have planned for me because I have no one? Oh, my goodness, you have the whole world. There you go. Uh, May, you took care of your parents. That's one beautiful gesture. Who knows that you're not going to get married unless you're like 90 years old. And even then, believe me, there have been romances I've met with people who were 70 or 80 years old. You never know what's going to happen in your yeah, life. Yeah. And you can care for all kinds of people, even if it's just by your prayers, you know. Uh, you may, it may seem to you like you have no one if your parents have gone, but uh, if you would just go out a bit, in other words, have some, uh, use your own intelligence about social relationships, mm -hmm. even if you just join some parish organizations or something like that, sure. you'd be surprised at the uh, amount of friends you can have and get and serve. So please don't say you have no one. You have the whole world available to you if you wish to avail yourself of it. Now, maybe yeah. not romantically. That's like lonely hearts, Miss Lonely yeah. Hearts yeah, right, or whatever. Right. Exactly. But certainly as far as uh, experiencing a kind of love of friendship or a love of affection or unity in religion or unity in something else that you may enjoy. Okay. Uh, it, it, it could be uh, quilt making or something like that. Yeah. So, uh, no, I don't. Please don't isolate yourself in that way. May, thank you so much for uh, listening to us today on YouTube. Open line Thursday with Father Brian Milady in progress here. We have about 20 minutes left in the show, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. Still time for you to call at 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Father Brian, 833-288-3986. Jack in Long Island, Father, who says, Father, the solemnity of the Annunciation falls on a Friday in Lent this year. And Canon 1251 says that, quote, abstinence from eating meat is to be observed, is to be observed every Friday unless a Friday occurs on a solemnity. This canon and the neighboring canons do not seem to make a distinction here regarding solemnities on Fridays in Lent and outside of Lent. So should we read this as meaning the abstinence from meat on Annunciation this year is lifted? even though it is a Lenten Friday. Thank you, Jack. Uh, well, the canon presumes that you're required to fast during us that Friday, and the sure. only Fridays at the moment that you're required to fast during are the ones in Lent. So yes, of course, it's a feast day. It's a solemnity. It's, actually, it's the Feast of the Incarnation because it's when Christ took flesh. Yeah. Remember, in the Nativity is about him coming out of Mary's womb, but mm -hmm. the actual time he took flesh is celebrated on the Annunciation. Now, I don't want to second-guess your bishop. <laughs> your bishop may decide, regardless of canons or whatever, that the abstinence still remains. But I, I, I must say, I, I think abstinence during Fridays is a wonderful thing because it used to be what set Catholics off from the rest of the world. Yes. But it, but people take this so seriously, you would think it's like murder if you let a crumb of meat touch your mouth. And, you know, the other thing is that I was told by someone once, I don't know if this is true or not, that Italians, even in the old times, had a dispensation from the Friday abstinence of meat for pasta sauce. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Not for anything else. Okay. But for pasta sauce. And, you know, the, I grew up in the Diocese of the Military Ordinariate because my father was an Air Force colonel. Uh -huh. Because of the demands of the various Air Force bases in the various parts of the world, we were always excused from observing the Friday abstinence. Really? Really? Remember, it's a symbol of penance. Mm-hmm. It's not to be taken like the only reason it's a mortal sin if you pious you callously disregard it, not if you forget, is because it shows contempt for church law and church practice and the commandments of the church. But if the canons allow you uh, and a solemnity is we should feast on a solemnity. If it was St. Joseph, it would be the same. Sure. The two, two Fridays in Lent when you're allowed to have meat if they fall on a Friday, are the Feast of St. Joseph and the Feast of the Annunciation. 
not on all the others. Also, I'm also, I have to say, I'm kind of struck by when Catholics give up things, and it's a good practice to do that. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that this doesn't apply on Sunday. You know, your Lenten penances don't apply on Sunday because Sunday's the day of the Lord. All the rest of the week, yes. But uh, people need to have a little bit of instruction in this. I, I've been astonished at some of the yeah. strange ideas I've experienced. Even during this Lent, I was giving communion recently, and uh, the circular host, you know, yes. had a tiny little piece off of it. So it wasn't perfectly circular. Uh -huh. And I handed the host to this woman and she says, it's defective. And she handed it back to me. Wow. <laughs> I said, what? Defective. No, it's not defective. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we need to have a little education in our religion again about these things. Absolutely. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm very glad that you're so concerned um, uh, about um, being strict and disciplined when it comes to embracing your Latin penances. But the Mary's incarna incarnation and Mary's annunciation is, after all, something we should celebrate big time. Yes, indeed. Jack, thank you so much uh, for your email. We do appreciate hearing from you on Long Island. It is uh, Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Milady. Still time for a call or two at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 833- 288-3986. want to tell you about one of our wonderful weekend programs, and that is called Mother Angelica Answering the Call. If you've never heard it, this is a great show to check out. Uh, Father Joseph Mary and uh, Doug Keck host this great uh, program, which brings back some of the phone calls that Mother Angelica has taken over the years, uh, basically in the 80s and the 90s, on her live show that she would do every Tuesday and Wednesday evening. And uh, it, it is great to hear Mother fielding these phone calls and answering questions from people all over the world, which is something that we do here on uh, Open Line. This week, uh, one of the programs, one of the questions that Mother is going to tackle is abortion and the value of life. And I've got to tell you, Mother has quite a bit to say about this and the importance of life and, and its sanctity from you know, from, uh, you know, conception to natural death. Mother was all about that. You can hear this great show on Saturday evenings at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern and also at 2 p.m. in the afternoon on EWTN Radio. Here's a question that we received from Connie in Oregon. Connie says, I spent 20 years way in my distant past involved with multiple occult practices, including the Ouija board at the age of 10, Transcendental Meditation, Shamanism, Palm Reader, Seance, Yoga, Reiki, and other Eastern and New Age practices. So would it be wise to discuss in depth with a priest to discern spiritual compromise of my soul? Now, I did confess all this stuff, but not in detail because there wasn't time. I know that I'm forgiven, but I do worry about any residual demonic issues. I am a practicing cradle Catholic, but I did stray away in my teens, 20s, and 30s. Today I am 68. Thank you, Connie. What do you think, Father? Well, Connie, I think you probably passed the uh, influence of the demonic on your soul by the fact that the way you practice your religion. But if it gives you consolation and it helps you to express this to a priest, I think it would be a, a fine idea to do that. You're not required to do that morally, but I think it might be a fine idea, yeah. like I say, yeah. just for you to finally put it behind you. But your, your experience is something that we should tell everyone about mm -hmm. because there are people who think that these practices are like games. Yeah. People used to get Ouija boards for Christmas. I remember that. And uh, I remember with the Dominicans brothers once, we had a brother who decided to dabble. He, he, oh, it was a little different. And uh, he always he decided to dabble in tarot cards. Uh-oh. So he was reading people's fortunes. And, they, of course, they thought it was a lark. Well, I was very nervous by this because I felt something in the room that I did not like. Mm. So I'd have absent myself, and they'd laugh. Well, about two months after this started, all of a sudden, no one mentioned the tarot cards anymore. Now, in community life, you know, you don't just blot it out, blot it out, burn it, 
blurted it out. You have to wait for the proper way and the proper way to ask it. Uh So one time I said, by the way, whatever happened to the tarot cards? Oh, (laughs) we're not dealing with having them again. I said, what happened? Well, we asked the tarot cards if there was an evil force behind them, and they answered yes. Whoa. (laughs) And we asked the cards if the evil force was the devil, and they answered yes. (laughs) Oh, my. <laughs> and the cards went in the trash the next day. Good. And good. so I said, well, I think the cards are a little more intelligent than some of the Dominican brothers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these things are not neutral. Yeah. And, of course, in the 70s, uh, late 60s, early 70s and 80s, everybody was into things like TM mm-hmm. and Neat yeah. Rokey and all that stuff. Uh, it's It was quicksand. It was just spiritual quicksand, how stupid this yeah, was. Yeah, Especially when you have a decent religion with decent ritual practice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I, I know that this is something that uh, John Ed Williams talks about every Wednesday, along with uh, Sue Brinkman, who researches all this stuff. And it's not harmless. It is not innocent. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff we've got no business poking around into. Right. So there it is. All right, and uh, thank you so much uh, for your email. Here's a question from John that just came in. Since God can't create evil, how did it come into the world? Did Satan create it, or did it come into the come into being spontaneously? Okay, first of all, you're using the wrong words. To say that you create evil suggests evil is a thing. And St. Augustine, many, many centuries ago, was very clear that evil is not a thing. It's a lack in a thing. Mm. It's a lack of a due perfection. Also, there's two kinds of evil, one of which has nothing to do with morals. It's called physical evil. So it's like a person who has a curved tibia. The tibia, the leg doesn't do what it should do, and you limp. Mm -hmm. That's physical evil. You're not responsible for that. It's just the way of matter. Matter isn't perfect. But spiritual evil is something that we cause, Satan causes, everyone the free will causes, where we enter into an interior action in a way which is contrary to the law of God. And if you want to put it this way, in physical evil, the evil of being a curved tibia leads to the evil of action being lame. But in moral evil, the evil of action, the fact that our heart loves something false causes a lack of order in our being, in our soul. And so it's caused by free choices, whether they're Satan's or ours, in which we choose something which is contrary to the truth. Okay. Appreciate that. And uh, John, thanks for your question. Here's one from Gene listening to us on YouTube. Father, could you give me guidance for teaching teenagers on purity and on fasting? Oh, (laughs) good luck with that. (laughs) Teenagers, huh? I taught teenagers for years. Okay. Look, in purity, I think what you want to do is emphasize that they wouldn't want to be used by someone else. Because all lust is basically dominating another person and using them. Mm-hmm. They want to only freely give themselves. And in other words, to emphasize that love is a gift, not a right, first of all. And secondly, that love cannot be demanded of another person or extorted from them. That kind of thing they sort of relate to. When I taught morals in high school, to the boys, I used to use the screw tape letters. Oh. Uh, and they had to read those because there's a lot of stuff in there about Satan's influence over, um, well, marital relationships, if you want to put it. Yes, that. yes. Regarding fasting, well, really, they're not exactly required to fast, as you know. They're required to abstain from meat. But people aren't required to fast until I believe they reach age 18. So fasting is and it's partially because of their physical makeup. I'm 75. I'm not required to fast anymore because of my health. Uh-huh. So, But you want to give them the idea that they need to discipline their 
affections and their needs a bit. And, uh, you know, there are lots of things where people do that for sports reasons and beauty reasons. Well, if you can do that for those reasons, you should be able to do something, even a token. It doesn't have to be deep for God. Okay. Well, very good. And thank you so much, uh, Gene, for your question. Here's one from Natalie. Uh, I was wondering about a teaching on marriage. I understand the church's teaching on earthly marriage is that it ends once a soul dies on earth. If that soul dies and they go to heaven for the highest union with God, wouldn't there still be marriages in heaven since Adam was married in Eden when he was in the perfect state of being still? Thanks for answering my question, Natalie. All right, Natalie. First of all, Eden was not heaven. Okay. Eden was an earthly condition. Adam and Eve still had to merit heaven. If Eve, if Eden had been heaven, they couldn't have sinned. Also, they couldn't have died. They'd have to have a resurrected body. Eden is not heaven. It's a, a condition where we reflect the fact that because man is at peace with God in grace on earth, he also is at peace with nature because God created nature. But it's not heaven. It's not eternity. Marriage exists and was created on this earth for the sake of the procreation and education of children and for the unity of the parties. And it's the procreation and education of children that's the particular relationship on which this unity of parties occurs in love. That presumes sex. Obviously, when you die, you can't have children anymore. Mm -hmm. You don't have sex anymore. You have a risen body. Uh, and though you may preserve in your soul the special relation you have with your spouse, there is no, and our Lord says it, remember, there is no marrying or giving in marriage in heaven. And he's even kind of condemnatory of the Sadducees who, who presented with that question about the so-called law of Leveret from the Old Testament, if a man died, a woman dies, a woman dies, yeah, and the brother can marry the, uh, the woman, and the children that they raise up will be considered the children of the first brother. Mm. So then they said, okay, well, there are seven men who mar married this woman. Whose wife will she be in heaven? And Jesus says, what? You are ignorant, you know, neither the law or, or you know, reason or faith. Because in heaven, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. They're like angels. That doesn't mean to say we don't have bodies. Right. But we have resurrected bodies, which are the same body we have, but have very different properties than merely a physical body here on earth. Some are the same. Remember, Jesus ate a piece of fish. Yeah. But his body can also pass through walls. Ours can. That's true. Natalie, uh, thank you so much uh, for your question. And Father, would you please leave us with your yeah? Please leave us with your blessing. Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. There was one uh, text that came in at the very last minute. We don't have time enough to do that. Uh, but Andrew, if you're listening to us, uh, please text us again next week, and we'll hopefully get that on the show at that time. On behalf of our fantastic team behind the glass, I'm Tom Price, along with Father Brian Milady. Have a great day. We'll see you next time here on EWTN. God bless.